In this video, I've got a recording of a Skype call that I had last night with Emilia Gardner. Emilia earns a full-time income from home. She's got a number of different revenue streams on the go, including affiliate, YouTube, and content ads. During the call, we spoke about all sorts of different things, including the recent Google algorithm update, how she comes up with ideas for content, how she creates her content. We talk about buying websites. Yeah, we cover all sorts of things. I think you're gonna really enjoy it and get a lot of value out of it. Be sure to check out Amelia's channel. You'll find a link to it in the description along with links to everything else that we talk about. Just one more thing before we get started. If you're new here, why not subscribe? Make sure you click the bell to be notified when I upload new videos and to make sure you don't miss out on the live stream. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button. It really does help me out. But anyway, I think that's enough intro. Roll the tape. Okay, so I'm here with Emilia and um, she is an ex-lawyer turned YouTuber and internet marketeer, now earns a full-time income from home. Um, you should definitely go check out her YouTube channel. I'll put a link up in a card now. You'll also find links to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, links to everything that we talk about uh, in the description of this video. So I've got some questions that I'd already written down and uh, were ready to ask, but yesterday there was a big update on Google. Um, they've changed the algorithm in some way. Uh, Carl, another YouTuber who's also a regular on my channel, he's just done a video, I noticed about that. And before we went uh, and hit the record button, me and Amelia were talking about it and she said that one of her sites had been affected by it. So tell me about this algorithm update and what's happened to one of your sites. Well, I don't think it's just one, actually. Sad to say, I was checking the analytics and I think it is multiple and not always in a bad way. I have nine sites, I think, right now and it's bad when you have to actually think about it. It's a sign yeah. that it's too many, basically. Too many sites, yeah. But the main case study site that I post about on YouTube, because I don't post about them all, uh, has taken, uh, yesterday we were down 25%, which is a huge bummer because been riding the wave, the pandemic wave of, of traffic going up. And so that was demoralizing. Yeah. But I did go and check some of the other sites and I have sort of a a site that's been in the garage for um, about the last 18 months I haven't done anything with. It's a project that I want to get out here and work on eventually. And it's seen a massive uptick. I mean, I haven't checked the stats on it in a while. It's like, huh, I wonder what it is about that one that I didn't do on that one. And why is one going, you know, like yeah, this? Yeah, I was going to say, is there anything you can draw from that? Is there some some shady SEO technique that you used on one and you didn't use on the other? Or are they both similar in terms of what you've been doing to them? Sadly, I'm not a terrible expert at um, black hat, gray hat, or any of these things. Um, I definitely put myself in more of the intermediate category, and I'm not going out of my way, honestly, to do lots of extra things to my sites. I tend to focus on creating content around long tail keywords and kind of hoping for the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, which is not everybody's doing, strategy, but. <laughs> no. But okay, what so I am maybe thinking, maybe it's the niche. Is it are they in different niches? Is one or niche? Sorry, I should say, um, is one in maybe health and the other not? I don't know. They are not uh, anywhere related at all. And what I have been doing so far, because again, I don't know if tomorrow it's going to be different, was trying to figure out if it is domain level or at the page level. And from what I can see for the site that is down and the one it is up, that it is affecting specific URLs, so specific pages, specific keywords are either performing better or worse, probably depending upon what is actually on the page. So on page SEO, you know, what... Uh, and I don't know necessarily if it's keyword density or length or something has changed, though, that some of the pages who that were doing really well are now just, you know, tanked, just like down. That's, and then some, weird, yeah. um, you know, and, and no specific rhyme or reason yet. So I can't say, oh, it's like related to products or, oh, it's related to something that's somewhat health related or lifestyle related. I just see some that are have gone up significantly. But unfortunately, um, one or two of the pages that were hit were some that were drawing a lot of traffic into the site. So maybe if it hadn't hit those larger pages, I wouldn't be sitting here thinking, you know, oh, what was me? But that is just sort of how it played out. Yeah, so how much do you think your traffic is down by? I mean, it's probably too early to say. I will say that I think that sometimes Google does a little bit of a dance in these changes and sites can move quite dramatically over the next couple of weeks as it's trying to kind of just bed in the algorithm changes. But 
at first glance, how much do you think you're down on the traffic? Yesterday was 25% on the case study site. So, okay. I mean, we'll see how it plays out today. I mean, maybe it will bounce back. Because, you know, I mean, it does ripple up and down. And so we don't necessarily know. Um, the first day, because I think it officially started to roll out on the 4th. So what I, you know, when okay. I saw the, oh, we're rolling today. And on the first day, it was like, oh, I'm all good. Because I didn't see any changes at all. And then I logged in the next day and it was like, oh. Okay. Yeah, well, hopefully yeah, there'll be some more information about it as we move forward. I've checked my analytics today and I can't see anything dramatically happening to my case study site, but um, I don't know. And I don't know if these changes take longer to affect UK rankings or UK sites. So then my site is targeting America, I don't know. I think it's a bit early to say, so hopefully things will change and we'll figure out what has changed and we can obviously work with it. And I guess that's one of the, the things with our business models um, in the internet marketing space. If you're a affiliate marketer or if you're a someone that depends on traffic from places like Google or Facebook, is that we are in these big companies' hands to a certain degree. And if Google decides decide to send you less traffic, then yeah, you get less traffic. If Amazon decide to cut your commission rates, you get less money. And there's not a lot we can do about it. However, we can change and adapt, I guess. I mean, that's that's one thing about internet marketers. We we don't tend to give up that easily and we're able to learn new skills and adapt and change our businesses quite quickly. So Oh, we have to. I mean, there's no there's no yeah. doubt about it. We have to be prepared to adapt at a moment's notice. Yeah, because things can change overnight. And they, there's been a, quite a few big changes over the last few weeks, hasn't there? Um, I honestly feel, though, that it's been in the last year that there's just been a lot of turbulence overall. I mean, it, there's always been these updates rolling out regularly. It just seems like in the last 12 to 18 months that there's just maybe more turbulence overall from the Google than there mm -hmm. has been previously. Yeah. But I mean, saying that, when you look at the bigger picture, um, every business can be affected by a, you know, a sudden change like the whole coronavirus thing has had a devastating effect on businesses that were doing really well like airlines and uh, and other retail businesses cafes bars i mean restaurants yeah. stuff happens doesn't it and <laughs> you can you can do all you can to protect yourself but stuff does happen and as long as you can adapt and change and, and try and stay positive as much as you positive possibly can you should be fine well, looking at it, the mentality of like, this is a challenge that I need to overcome. And I also need to be in a place where I'm not going to be as impacted by one of my streams or one of my adventures or one of my projects, you know, going sideways. Like, yeah, it sucks that one of my sites that I've worked on sort of relentlessly for the past 12 months just got hammered by Google. But at the same time, I mean, I'm not... I'm not ready to throw in the towel and quit because I have set other things up so that I'm, I mean, it's not the end of the world for me. No, good. And I guess that's the other benefit of being an internet marketer is that you can have multiple revenue streams. You can put your eggs in different baskets as opposed to having them all in one basket. But anyway, so that's a bit of a current uh, what's going on at the moment chat. I wanted to kind of talk about you a little bit more just so that viewers that may not be familiar with what you do uh, can learn a little bit more about you. So how long have you been doing this whole internet thing? Well, seriously, I would say it's only been since about 2018. And even in 2018, I wasn't really that serious. I honestly really only committed to, you know, this is the thing I want to do. This is sort of the, I'm put up, putting up my air quotes, like the career I want to have was in the spring of 2019. So I'm still really new to this compared to where a lot of people are. And I would expect that most of the people who follow the stream have more experience than I do. Okay. Well, yeah, I know a lot of some of my viewers do uh, do have quite a bit of experience. So there's a lot of people that are just starting or thinking about starting as well. And um, it's good that you've got to where you are in such a short time. I think you've done fantastically well. Um, well so you. how did you en end up getting into this um, this whole make money online area that a lot of people think is a scam, but obviously isn't? <laughs> You know, I didn't know that it wasn't a scam until I sort of fell into it. Um, I did a project with one of a, my colleagues in 2016, actually was self-publishing a book. And I don't recommend that you go and read it, by the way, um, <laughs> because I think that it still needs work, but it's out there. And it just sort of introduced me to the to the realization that this was real. Like it, it was proof of concept, right? It, we didn't make a lot of money. In fact, I think we lost money on the project overall, but it just made me realize that this was something people were doing and the people who were doing it well were making quite a bit of money at it. And so I, I didn't go in all in at that point, but in 2018, it was more like a hobby. I was thinking, okay, you know, I have this time. I was at home with my youngest child and I, and I just couldn't not do something. And I thought, okay, what a great time to 
try this out and try KDP again. So that's where I started. Okay, I'm going to self-publish some eBooks under a pen name. And of course, the books are terrible. Like they're just <laughs> terrible because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't um, I didn't try to learn. I was like, oh, I'm just going to throw this out there. And of course, I didn't have great success. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't try to learn. But that really, I just, I, I was sucked in. Like I was convinced that it could work if I just kept trying. And that's really how I fell into it. Wow, that's a great attitude. I think that's, that's you're half the way there at least if you've got that staying staying attitude and you're gonna determine to kind of push on. Um, so at what point did you start earning enough money to kind of call it a proper full-time thing? Well, you know, you say what what counts as full time, like when you know what counts as proper money. Like that's going to be a different number for everybody, uh, you course, know. And when yeah. I started this, I was already sort of not working, right? I was at home. Um, I'd already to make that transition to stay at home had made some drastic cuts to my budget and my life so that it was easier for me to be at home and not have to worry about much money. But in the last year, in the last twelve months, it wasn't terribly difficult to get there because I made some moves to sort of jumpstart that. Like a lot of people start, you know, from scratch with building sites. And I decided, well, I have this money here. I'm just going to um, start some sites and I'm going to buy some. And so I went ahead and did invest in some sites that were already earning so that I could work on them and learn them. Cause you know, the idea is like, well, this is a concept that's already working. And if I can see what is already working as a place to get started, rather than starting with something that is not working at all, and then trust in my own inexperience to build it up into something that is working, I feel like I have the best of both worlds. Because yeah, I have, that's a great you know, idea. So, how are those investments now? Are, did they are they still working? They are still working, and, and it has been sort of a bumpy ride, a fun uh, but bumpy ride, because I have learned a ton about website investing. And about you know buying and selling businesses, which is sort of another niche that I have on my YouTube channel because I've documented sort of I guess going through that process, and that's really kind of where I started to grow on YouTube. Is I made a video about my experience with Empire Flippers, and the Empire Flippers people shared it because I guess not a lot of people do that. Yeah. Um, but I realized then sort of the power of you know starting to see viewers coming in and starting to see activity on my YouTube channel because of that share. And it got me fired up about YouTube in general. It was a vulnerable moment. And I, I still, to this day, I don't tell people how much I spent on that side. I generally just say, you know, what sort of return that I've been able to get back because I'm yeah. still kind of shy about saying, well, I had this money, you know, sort of laying around and decided to spend it, uh, send it to the Philippines. And I tell you, the people at the bank thought I was insane. They're like, you're sending that money where? To the, to, you have to wire the money to the Philippines? Are you sure? Um, yeah, I've, and, I've never bought a site for Empire Flippers. I will have to have to check that out. Yeah, no, it was a really good experience um, to work with them. And I think that they're legitimately trying to provide a good service for their buyers and sellers. And I wouldn't hesitate to recommend them, honestly. Okay. Yeah, I, I've heard some good things about them. I mean, I've only bought the odd site and sold the odd site on Flipper, which I think is probably a, a different experience to the Empire I, have, I, I did it too. I did it. I totally did it too. Trying like chasing sort of the experience and the knowledge. And so actually that other sort of garage site that I have that I've been watching was a was my Flippa experiment. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'll definitely have to uh, check out your video on that. So um, when you're thinking about starting a new site, how do you come up with a niche or a, a product or whatever you're gonna be building the site around? Uh, in fact, if, before we get onto that, how do you actually get your, your money online? Is it through affiliate or is it through advertising? I I collect money in every which way possible <laughs> that there is to be collected as an internet marketer. Um, I am really concerned about losing a stream because of something like an update or a change to an affiliate program. So I actually do um, Skillshare, which I don't think a lot of people do. Um, but I like that as sort of another platform where you can earn money sort of passively because I don't have the time to be over there actively marketing courses. Um, but I do um, YouTube. I make some money there. I do uh, affiliate commissions, so Amazon. And then I have other affiliate programs associated with sites. And then I do display ads with AdSense and Azoic. Okay, so you've got a good mix there of different revenue streams. Okay, so yeah, back on to the, uh, the next question then. So... Um, how do you choose which niche or which products you're going to start promoting? 
Well, I think if you're a beginner or intermediate or expert level, that is going to be a different answer for everyone. And so I can only speak as sort of, I would say, an intermediate person because somebody who is an expert level, they might have a team, they might have the ability to easily outsource a lot of things, and they can basically just go and look at competition, just straight up product competition, pump it out to their team, and then just let it ride. But for me, if I'm creating most of the content, it has to be something that I can actually write about. And so it tends to be something that's not necessarily a passion. I try to balance sort of the ability to create the content um, cheaply, uh, usually like out of my head or with minimal amount of research without so much competition. So I wouldn't, I mean, I, I love to cook, right? But I wouldn't go and create a recipe blog right now because it is so competitive. There's no way I feel like with my skills that I could rank there. So I tend to focus on things that I have just enough experience about that there isn't a ton of competition in there. And that isn't something that you might be able to figure out in five minutes or a day or even a week to find the perfect one. For people who are beginners, I I really think that whatever it is that will get you started is where you should go. And maybe it isn't the right one. Maybe it fails. Maybe it never makes you a dollar. But the next time you do it, I mean, it will be so much easier for you to do. It's just, I don't, I can't think of anybody in this space who hit it out of the park with their first sight. No. There Can you think of anybody in... whose first sight just grew no, that, to, have to be seven lucky, figures? There's, bit, there's definitely some luck involved, isn't there, in choosing the right niche and product and all that kind of stuff. However much research or whatever else you want to do, there's going to be luck involved, luck and timing. I mean, I don't know if I will start a new site from scratch again, honestly, after the whole investing experience, because you just never know, right? With a brand new site and a brand new domain. I mean, I can throw everything I have at it, right? My effort, my money, everything. And some of them just won't catch. They won't catch fire. But if you have something you already know is ranked and is already earning at least a little bit and you say okay i know enough i could pour gasoline on this fire with my time my effort my money and then skip over a lot of that and that's i probably will go forward from there rather than starting from scratch again yeah i mean that makes sense but i guess there's some people that just don't have any money to invest and they all they have is time so but that's not necessarily a bad thing though either you you say okay well where would you want to work towards i mean i didn't start my i mean i how many sites did I start that just totally tanked? I mean, five, <laughs> six. I probably have six sites over the years that I started, you know, really excited about and then just not having a plan just totally failed. I mean, I guess people don't really think about that, you know, when you're starting a site and thinking, oh, this is going to be the first one that will fail. And, oh, this will probably be the second <laughs> one that will fail. No, you always uh, have but, high hopes, don't you, when you start your site? I do. But, you know, just knowing me and what my – limitations are and you know and the experience level i guess looking forward i mean i can see why guys like matt diggity i talked to him a couple months ago and he's like yeah i wouldn't start from scratch anymore and i say well good for you i i don't have 50 grand to dump into a site and a team to hand it off to but he does and he can make a really good living doing that okay so we've just spoke about um choosing a niche or a niche or a product um how do you go about coming up with ideas for your content and um Oh my God, how much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I almost always start with a keyword of some kind. And I have evolved over time, uh, many different methods of doing this, primarily because I am probably still on the hunt for what I think is like the one, like the method that I think that produces the best results. I mean, you can, I've done, I feel like I've done them all, right? Like I've used Ahrefs and just looked for low competition keywords of any kind that I think could possibly be uh, worthwhile on this particular site in that niche. Um, I've done Alphabet Soup, you know, where you go and Google and you just start looking for suggested or is it the LSI keywords, you know, just looking for something that people are actually searching for and then checking for competitiveness, Um, I have gone to Google search console and like check to see what keywords that GSC says that I'm ranking for that I haven't necessarily written on. Like, okay, I have a a page about, uh, you know, I'm looking out my window, like squirrels running on the fence. Like maybe I also rank for ferrets running on the fence, but I haven't written about them. So maybe that's a good place to crank out an article. I could probably rank for something in the top five if I'm already ranking in the top five for it, but maybe, you know, I'm not actually addressing that question. Um, 
I will, I don't, I never copy things, right? Like I never go and look at websites uh, to copy their articles, but I will go to other websites and see what people are writing about. Like what is trending in a, this specific niche? I will check the sitemaps of people's websites and I honestly will go down and look for the idea, but I won't click on the article because I don't want to get in there and feel like I'm copying or trying to steal their, the, like the meat of their ideas. I'll just say, oh, like this person wrote about going to Orlando in June. That's a great idea. And that would totally fit in my website. And then I will go and look for keywords that are unique to me and mine. But, you know, if this person is a successful blogger and, and maybe there's a reason why they wrote on that topic, maybe it was something they knew about, but also maybe they had determined from their own research that it would be something they could compete for. And then I will go and do my own analysis to do that. I mean, like I said, how long have you got? Because I literally am always shopping for different ways to try to figure out what is the best way to get an article up and to rank. Yeah, I mean, well, I use a number of those techniques as well, the, the alphabet one, alphabet soup for sure. Um, so that means you've always got a big list of content to write, have you? I do, and unfortunately, I think I'm in love with the process. I am in love sort of with the treasure hunt of looking for the right keyword, and what it can mean is that I don't spend enough time creating content. And what it probably means I should do is just hire a writer or outsource it to a content farm and then actually make use of those keywords. But because I am still conservative about spending my money, um, just I, I want to feel like the site is successful before I go and dump more money into it. And maybe that's counterintuitive. I need to dump money into it to make it successful. But, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm still in the beginning with this particular site. And so a lot of times what I end up is just many pages of keywords that I haven't done anything with yet. Okay. So talking about writing articles, um, so you write them all yourself? Uh, right now I am. I haven't always. With the case study site I talk about on my YouTube channel, I launched with the help of some writers that had gotten from uh, pro blogger jobs, that job board. Mm -hmm. And then some people that I had just connected with over on Facebook that I knew personally who were looking for, you know, to make some extra money. And I thought, hey, you know, you can write pretty well. And Let's see, you know, if I can just get you to create the content, then I'll edit it for, you know, the website. And of course, what I got back wasn't perfect, but it was something that I could use and something I didn't have to create for myself. It was very, very cheap. And I feel like I was helping the world, you know, <laughs> like these people needed money and I had money to spend on this. And so we were, everybody got something yeah. they wanted. <laughs> but now you do, you do most of it yourself. Is there any tools or anything you use to help you write? Do you have a, like a document template or... I, I, I don't, you know, I, I really am anti tools for the most part. Um, just because I feel like we get obsessed with spending money on things that would help us to get to where we want to go. And really what we need to do is just do the work to get to where we want to go. Yeah. And maybe that will hold me back like that attitude, but mostly I just try to think, um, and I don't use Yoast. Like I don't worry too much about keyword density. And again, Maybe that just exposes me for being sort of a newer um, newer SEO or, or newer in this. Um, I have tested out Surfer a, a little bit and I'm still sort of working through what I think about it, honestly. But uh, you know, mostly it's just trying to get something out there that I think of as comprehensive, that answers the question and it's at least a thousand words. And you say that's kind of an arbitrary number, but I figure if it's at least a thousand words, then it's probably not going to get hit with any sort of low content type penalty, you know, for what you have on the page. And hopefully I'll only choose topics where um, there's enough to write about. So if the, the the topic, the question is, you know, what time is it in Dallas? I mean, I'm not going to write on that because I can't write a thousand words on that. And it's going to be answered by Google in the snippet anyway. I mean, yeah. that's not something worth yeah. writing about. No, no, that makes sense. But um. I think, yeah, just you have a rough guideline when it comes to the number of words and then, you know, you need to write whatever the article needs, don't you? Or whatever whatever content it needs to answer the question or, or fulfill its promise from the from the title. I mean, I definitely do some things. Like I try, um, I, don't, I don't have a template going, but in my head as I'm writing, you know, I try to write with shorter sentences. Um, you know, I try to not use my giant vocabulary as much as I might if I were writing something like a legal document, right? I, I mean, not to downplay people on the internet, but I mean, most of the time they're reading on little phones, right? They're not necessarily um, on my website because they want to read a tome or a, a legal novel, like they're looking to get information. So yeah. I, you know, leads lots of white space. So I don't do giant paragraphs. Um, I use lots of headers. 
when I can to sort of explain where we're going. Um, and I also just try to use the keyword naturally. So not necessarily stuff it, but if the topic is, uh, you know, cherry cheesecake, then I'm going to say, you know, this is what I'm making in this particular thing and then use the words around it, but in a natural way. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you don't use any SEO plugin or anything? No, no, you Not don't. right now. And I have people after me, you know, some friends of mine who say, oh, you know, you don't have a rank tracker. And I said, no, I don't. And oh, you don't use this thing. I'm like, no, I don't. And maybe uh, I should. I probably should. Maybe. Probably maybe. should track. I, I think I like the SEO plugins. They do a few important tasks that are quite useful, like adding all your markup and um, Google Webmaster setups. And they, they, admit they generate your sitemap. And I think all that stuff is useful from a plugin. But the actual on-site optimization of content is maybe not that useful. I don't I don't because there's some people I know that get obsessed with their SEO plugin and they're constantly trying to get a green light or score, you know, 100 out of 100 and I think that can take away from actually just writing a good article. <laughs> you know, I think in the beginning for people and I put myself in that category when I first got started, I definitely used Yoast and I still have used on my sites, but mostly for the sitemap. I don't do it to follow any of the traffic lights or anything I use it for the meta description and then mm -hmm. for the sitemap yeah which is mainly uh, for, what you need yeah. yeah but when you're first getting started and you don't know anything about seo it, it helps you get into the mindset of cre crafting something to be posted with seo in mind and maybe it's not the right things but it, it does you know get you thinking okay you know what I need to be thinking about the keyword. I chose a keyword, first of all, which many people in the beginning, like myself, when I first started and failed, I didn't think about creating a, an article around a keyword for organic Google search. And so it puts you in that mindset. It wants to know, like, what is your keyword? And have you used it in your article? And have you used it in a title? And um, it just puts you in the mindset of creating yeah, yeah, yeah. web content. No, no, it certainly doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of take it for granted that we expect people to understand that you're writing to answer someone's search on Google. That's why we do keyword research. But yeah, it wasn't so long ago that people just put anything up. They didn't really think about what people were looking for. They just just, just wrote content because they wanted to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and that is still a viable way to create a blog and to create a resource. But yeah. people who are really hungry to try to get content as quickly as possible I mean, they're going to have to do it with the strategy in mind. Yeah. So in terms of how you get traffic to your sites, it sounds like the majority just comes from organic search via your content. Is there any other ways or any other things that you use to get traffic to your site? Right now, I'm wholly focused on organic search. And that is a strength and a weakness because I definitely am gaining a lot of skills in um, building organic search, but it does make me vulnerable. And so, you know, there's definitely some pressure in my mind to continue to build different streams. The thing that I've wanted to avoid avoided doing, though, was like spreading myself out too thin and say, OK, I'm going to do email marketing and Pinterest and Instagram and YouTube and organic search and then somehow expect them all to just do really well. So I've just been hyper focused on one with the goal in mind of feeling, OK, I've got this one down and I can do this without thinking too much and then move on. And I just don't feel like I'm in a place yet where I can say, you know, my my SEO, my SEO skills are in a place where I can say I've mastered that and I'm ready to move on. No, that makes sense. And organic traffic is generally the best. And um, a lot of sites, they're just completely powered off um, organic search. And they say, once you get it right, then it should just deliver you traffic without too much work. The problem with social media and those kind of things is they do need constant um, work on them and you need to feed them constantly with, with content and things. Okay. You know, the thing I think about too, though, is, you know, and I, and I've talked about this on my channel recently, but, um, eventual exits. I mean, most people, when we start a site, we're not necessarily thinking about the ideal avatar of the person who might take over the site. And maybe we don't think, oh, you know, we'll ever get rid of the site or maybe, you know, I'll be working in this forever. But, you know, the ideal, I sort of, I think situation for at least a site like mine is to build it up and put it into a good place and then to sell it and take that money and do other things with it. And so I have to think in my mind too of the potential buyer of my site. And if I want the site to be sold to someone who's probably someone like me, who's newer in the process and who might not be looking for a six figure site, but looking for a high five figure site that's successful, then maybe if I add all of those things that I might 
prevent myself from landing one of those buyers because they don't know how to do all those things. They aren't willing mm -hmm. to learn Pinterest and email and Instagram and SEO and all these things, but they might be willing to learn one of those things and then put down money for that. So it's sort of the balance of, okay, you know, do I want to do all these things for my site? And if I do, will it make it hard for me to sell it later? Yeah, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Okay, um, I think we're in it at the end. I've got just two more questions for you, um, and then we'll then we'll wrap it up. So the first question is um, for people that are thinking about starting this, and uh, you know now is a time where a lot of people are thinking of starting something because they're stuck inside and they're not going to work and all that kind of stuff. So, what would be your one bit of advice that you would tell that person? It doesn't necessarily have to be one. Actually, you can. It could be two or three bits. But <laughs> what's the first thing that springs to your mind? I think you may have already touched on it. Actually, I. I mean, in, in the end, I think that you need to pull the trigger and start something, because I think that it's a. Everything online is uh, like about momentum and building on what you already know. And when you're in the beginning, you don't know anything. If you're like me, at least when you start. And so the only way to learn something and know something is to try it. And then if it succeeds, great. And if it doesn't, you fail. And then you try something else based upon what you learned the last time. But just, you know, just starting, you know, without this fear and worry about what will happen when somebody finds out what you're mm -hmm. doing or that you sent money to the Philippines or without this anxiety of uh, what people will think or this anxiety about failing because I can almost guarantee you that when you are starting online, you're going to suck at first because everybody does. Mm -hmm. And if you can just accept that. It's and not a bad start, thing. It's going to happen. It's not. It's, it's going to happen. It's a great learning, learning process. A great it, there's learning a massive experience. learning curve in online. So if you're, if you're on the fence right now and you've never done anything online and you're watching this and thinking, what can I take away from it? I would tell you to shut off this video Go buy yourself a domain name. It might be the bad one. It might be the worst one. Go get some hosting from somewhere and just start. Yeah. Figure out the rest of it later. Just and then start. next time you can pick the perfect niche. And next time you can pick out all the things because all of this stuff right now will be easy. Yeah, exactly. And we've all been through that process of starting things and failing. And it's just, you know, part of internet marketing, part of life in general, really. And I actually remember that I was at Google at one time point and they coined it in a phrase and they basically said there's no failure there's only feedback uh, whatever that <laughs> means true but <laughs> i mean it, it, it's but it's a mindset shift yeah it really is because you you know you and, and maybe that's why people don't want to don't want to admit what they're doing because the likelihood of failing the first time it really is so high like you're putting yourself mm. out there and doing something that maybe your friends or family think is maybe insane or you know that you can't do it you can't make money doing that and then yeah. knowing that it's going to be hard in the beginning it's just really hard to want to jump into something that you know it's going to be I tough th i think that is always i've never really had too much of that anxiety or problem with friends and family because i've never really cared what they say <laughs> anyway but um <laughs> and i've also had this feeling that I, I really want another reason i want to be a success is just so that i can show those people that i can do it and that this is a thing and that i'm not completely crazy and I think it can be a, a, it can be like seen as a negative, but you can also switch it around and have it as a driver and say, you know, okay, I'm going to show those people I can do this, and you know, they'll see that. And when you get to a point where you start getting a little bit of success, they don't think you're crazy anymore. They start thinking you're quite a cool, and you know, that person that does the stuff on the internet. But um, the thing is, though, you have to start with the belief that yeah. you can do it. And if you are starting from the position of like, I'm not sure if this is going to work. It's like the if I succeed versus the when I succeed mentality. And I, I mean, if you want to, you didn't ask me this question, but it occurs to me what shift really took me from um, sort of making this a hobby and an experiment to making this the full time thing is I realized that it wasn't a matter of if it was when mm. like the that moment that if to when is when I was able to make this a full-time gig for myself. Yeah, that you've got that belief that it, you are gonna work, it is gonna work in the future. And mm -hmm. You're not gonna be having to go back to get a job or anything like that, it's just gonna happen and you just need to keep putting one foot in front of the other, doing the task, doing the jobs, and you'll eventually get to that point. Yeah, it's yeah, a I when, think... it's not, not if, it's when. Yeah, and there was one other thing that you touched on a bit earlier, which has come up a lot of times when I'm talking to people, um, and that is focus. 
you mentioned, I think when we're talking about article writing or whatever, and also that the fact that you've got too many sites like myself, too many sites on the go, and actually if you can start to focus on something, then that becomes really powerful. It really is. And I people say, you know, well, what what is it that you're really doing online? And and you know, I mean, I, I would say I'm obsessing, like I'm obsessive about this. Um, you know, to the point of this is I think about it all of the time and you say, Oh, well, you know, it's what's the difference between focus and obsession? <laughs> I'm not really sure, but not you know, a lot, that probably, obsession. No. But that <laughs> obsession, like that 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 mindset of like this is what I want to do and more than most things, I won't say more than anything else, but you know, to make this work, I'm so obsessed with making that happen that it's really easy to come to the computer and do that work. Like I don't have to kick myself to come here to make YouTube videos because I know that it's not if, it's when, it's when and all yeah. I have to do is get to the computer and it's going to happen. Maybe not tomorrow or yeah. next year. But you're moving a little bit closer towards that time, aren't you? Yeah. Great. Okay. The final one is just a bit of fun, really. I mean, um, we've talked about this before when we're not recording about other YouTubers. Who who are your favourite YouTubers? Who are some people that are in our kind of space that you that you watch regularly? Just so that we can well, link to them in the description, and other people can can go and discover them too. What a generous question. Seriously, what a generous question for a guy who has like what forty thousand subscribers or something <laughs> I, absurd. I still like, feel myself as a very very small YouTuber, and it wasn't that long ago where I was, where you are in terms of number of subscribers. So it can happen quickly, as you say. It will well, happen. I I do think though that that's an insightful sort of se like side comment because there really isn't that much difference between a thousand and forty thousand. How you feel? Like I just crossed a thousand subscribers and I thought when I started that a thousand would be like making it and I would be like, I would know what to do and how to do and I would be so different. It turns out I'm the same. And it was like six months ago that I was clawing for views and trying to get people to talk to me and nobody would. And I, I don't feel that different. No, no, it just kind of happens. And then you realize, yeah, that it wasn't such a big deal anyway. But yeah, so I mean, it could be someone that's, that's on 500 subscribers or someone that you watch that's on a million subscribers. Who do you like to watch? Well, right now I am really, really enjoying really small channels that are doing case studies. So there are people who are near the beginning of their journey and they post videos that talk about, here's where my site is at. Here's, you know, month on month, here's where it is and here's where it's going. And so these people, I actually try to interact with them a lot because their experience is similar to mine. So for folks, you know, who are on YouTube looking to consume content, I mean, it's great. You follow the big channels. They have millions of views, um, but those people don't have time to talk to me. I no. type something in the comments and they never respond back to me because they have 10,000 comments on a video. But somebody who is a smaller channel like Stuart, so Dotfix has been on your channel before. Um, mm -hmm. He is a great guy and he is working very hard and he's great to network with. I found this gal um, recently. Her channel is like just barely at 200. She just got started on YouTube. Her name is uh, Steph or Stephanie and gosh, um, I am totally blanking on her last name, but the channel is each day slow. And I think she is eventually going to have to change it to her name because um, it will help me remember what her name is. But she's got 200, um, 200 subs and she is posting now more of these update videos of like, here are the challenges for myself and here it is I'm growing. And it just feels so authentic. And I feel like I can relate to her. Um, who else am I following? I mean, I follow Carl Broadbent. He's on this uh, stream quite a bit. He checks in on your channel a lot. Yeah, yeah, Carl. I've got a good relation with Carl. Oh, now I'm going to have to go and look because it's like there really aren't that many, but the people I have, most of them are right around a thousand or two thousand. Um, uh, Leon, who has been on your channel, Leon Angus. Yeah, Leon Angus. Yeah, he's, uh, he's um, definitely Sh great. To watch. Sh Sean Mars, he's a guy who's got about six to seven hundred um, subscribers, and he is really, really, really. Um, good at the technical stuff like he's really obsessive about building stuff and he's focused heavily on amazon affiliate and so i feel like he knows what he's talking about i like to go and watch his stuff and he pretty much does uh q a videos so he answers questions from reddit where people are posting over there on reddit and then just comes over and makes videos about them and also does income reports hmm. uh, i watch I adrian's videos from hasta la vista boss oh yeah he's a regular on the stream uh, as well I like um, the location rebel. I don't actually know what his name is, but he's located here in the Pacific Northwest, not very far from 
where I am. And he is another guy who's actually building sites and working on sites. So I guess that's the folks that I follow are people that are actively in the trenches um, doing the site building stuff and, and sort of sharing the ups and downs and the bumps and the bruises. I mean, it's okay if they have a course, I think that's cool, but uh, that's not what I follow them for. I follow them for sharing their, yeah, their journey and their progress. It's good to share experiences and there's in your day to day life, especially now as we can't go out, but even before you could go out and you wouldn't be able to meet anyone else that does this stuff. So it was very hard to share experiences and, and talk about it and, and, I guess that's where YouTube comes in. You can find people that are doing a similar thing, see what they're up to, and as you say, engage with them. And it's great to share experiences in, in all walks of life, isn't it? Well, this live streaming thing that more of the YouTubers have started doing um, has definitely made these channels more interesting to me because a lot of these ladies and gals are and guys are starting to go live more. And so then you can actually have a conversation with them, not just in the comments and not over on Facebook Messenger, but they're talking and you're there and you can have like legitimate um, value transferred in those things. You can ask questions that you need answered or look for those experiences and they can respond live to you right there. And that's so valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been been fantastic. I hope you, uh, you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, well, and, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna snag you and make you come to my channel now. That's how this works. No, yeah, I'm, I look forward to it. I can't wait to to, to come on, onto your channel and you can ask me some questions and we'll and we'll see. And That'd see be how really that goes. fun. But, but yeah, thanks very much for joining me. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been really fun. That brings us to the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear from you. Do leave me a comment below. I do read all the comments that I get and I'll try to reply to as many as I possibly can. If you're not already subscribed, you can do so by clicking it on my face up there somewhere. Why not check out the vlog channel, click on my other face. And here are a couple more videos they've been chosen specially for you. Until next time, bye for now.